Hello YouTube and welcome back to X-Plane 11. Thank you very much for joining me in this video. This time we're going to be taking a look at the Vulcan. The Vulcan in X-Plane Vulcan. But this aircraft is something that I've been waiting for for about a couple of years. I think two years I've been waiting for this aircraft. It is by Just Flight and I'm going to be taking an in-depth look at this aircraft over the next two or three videos. In this video, I'm going to be going over the price, what the pack contains, what's actually what the aircraft is about. Uh, we're also going to look at system specifications. As I said with the aircraft, I'll read some of the history of the aircraft from the Just Flight website. Then we're going to be looking at the modeling, the texturing, maybe some of the sounds, and we're going to be looking inside the aircraft and getting ourselves familiarized with the entire cockpit. That's going to make this a pretty long video. And then in the second part, I'm going to be taking this aircraft off. So we'll start it up, taxi, take off, start flying it around, and then we'll see from there uh, what happens. It might end up being a third part where I actually land it. Already from the outside, it looks incredible, but we're just going to have to see uh, what, what exactly we have. So make sure you stay tuned for not just this episode, but the next one and perhaps the one after. So on your screens right now, you're going to be seeing the different variants of this aircraft, or should I say the different uh, liveries for this aircraft, and maybe a little bit in the way of different variants. But I'm going to be reading out some of the specifications and the price. So this aircraft is available for £39.99 from the Just Flight website. That's not a bad price. That's a, that's a fairly average price. I do, I do find that Just Flight's products are fairly reasonably priced overall. So I think that's a, that's a good average price for an aircraft of this quality. It contains, uh, three versions of this aircraft. As I said, the B Mark II, which is the one that you're seeing here, the K.2, which is the refueler, and the MRR, the Maritime Reconnaissance Radar. Looking at the liveries, I'm just going to quickly go through the liveries that you are seeing on screen as I'm doing some orbits. Uh, we have 11 liveries or 11 paint schemes. We have X-Ray Mike 655, which is what this aircraft is actually based off. We have X-Ray Lima 426, X-Ray Hotel 562, which is actually... Um, I think that one's got Kiwi roundels on it. So you can see the roundels of the RAF on the aircraft, on the wings and the front of the fuselage. And you can also see a fin flash on the tail. Uh, but I think this one's actually got Kiwi roundels on it. You've got XL361, which is painted in anti-flash white. And that is for protecting against thermal radiation in the case of a uh, nuclear strike. So the... The idea is that the anti-flash white protects the, protects the occupants of the aircraft. And of course, this is a nuclear, uh, this can carry a nuclear payload. You've got, uh, X-ray hotel 538, which has a white underside. Uh, X-ray Mike 607, which has a red flag. You've got X-ray hotel 534, which was based at, um, I think it was RAF Cottishall. I think Cottishall, Cottishall. Then you've got XM600, which is the one I'm going to be flying over the next few episodes. But, and that's, uh, based at RAF Cottesmoor. And RAF Cottesmoor is a really good one, uh, because it flies over some, some area of, uh, some body of water that I really like. Plus, that's where I actually am currently. We've got X-Ray Mike 607 in the black buck. Then you've got another one in anti-flash white, X-ray Lima 426. You'll also notice, notice the roundels on those are sort of pale. That's not a mistake. That's actually how they are, the pale roundels on them. And you'll also notice some of the roundels and fin flashes seem to be missing the white. It's just blue and red. Again, that's actually done intentionally. That's a, a low visibility roundel and fin flash. Then you've got the four paint schemes or the four liveries for the K2 version. So that was just the B2 version. This is the K2 version. You then have X-Ray Mike 571, 
X-Ray Lima 445, X-Ray Juliet 825 and X-Ray Hotel 558, all from 50 Squadron. So all of those are refuelers. Then you've got two variants of or two liveries for the MRR. That's X-Ray Hotel 560 and X-Ray Hotel 534, both from 27 Squadron. So that is all, or those are all the liveries that this aircraft comes in. Plenty of colours, plenty of things, I'm sure, something suited for everybody. I'm now going to read the detailed description as we're still probably going through the liveries on screen. And let's see uh, what we have here. So reading from the Just Flight website, in fact, before I do that, let me go through the system specifications, which is something I should have done earlier. System specifications require X-Plane 11, of course, uh, an Intel Core i5-6600K, which runs at 3.5 gigahertz. Honestly, I'm running this uh, currently on an i7-4770K. I am running it above 4 gigahertz, but it seems to be running okay. So as long as you've got um, 6600 or newer for the i5s, you're fine. If you're going a generation back, you probably want to make sure you've got an i7. AMD equivalent, I suppose you're looking at Ryzen 5s. Uh, Ryzen 5s as a minimum. 8 gigabytes of RAM or more, but if you're running a flight simulator, I think you should be trying to push yourselves up to as much RAM as you can. I run 32 gigabytes and I'm looking at uh, potentially upgrading that in a few months. A DX12 capable graphics card, whether you get that from Nvidia, AMD or Intel, probably not recommending the Intel one there, but you're looking at, uh, if you're Nvidia, you're looking at a GTX 1070 or higher I would say a 1080 is probably uh, pretty pretty decent uh, to use Windows is compatible with Windows 10 7 apparently with XP as well and Mac OS X and Linux and it takes 2.4 gigabytes I think is the installation size it's a 2 gigabyte download so that's the amount of hard drive space you need that's the system specifications. Let's go through and read this. Following on from their award-winning PA-28 series, Hawk T1 Advanced Trainer and C-152, this highly detailed simulation of the Avro Vulcan B Mark II, K2 and MRR is being developed by Just Flight's in-house team and Thrandra Design following comprehensive hands-on research with a real-life Vulcan B Mark II, X-Ray Mike 655, based at Wellesbourne Airfield. The Vulcan B Mark II is an iconic four-engine Delta Wing strategic bomber which saw service in the UK during the Cold War. X-Ray Mike 655, on which this product is based, was the third from last Vulcan to be produced for the RAF. It was delivered in 1964 and saw service as part of the UK's nuclear deterrent force throughout the 1960s and 1970s. It is now being preserved by a team of volunteers at Wellersbourne Airfield. This product also includes the K.2 air-to-air refuelling and maritime radar reconnaissance MRR variants that saw service with the Royal Air Force. Following the Falklands War, six Avro Vulcans were converted for air-to-air -air refuelling as an interim solution prior to the delivery of the VC-10 and TriStar tanker uh, aircraft that were due to replace the aging Victor tankers. This conversion consisted of the addition of a drum hose unit, HDU, mounted on the tail cone, and three Bombay drum tanks. The K2 variant served with 50 Squ Squadron, RF Waddington, from 1982 to 1984. In 1973, nine Avro Vulcan B Mark IIs were converted for maritime radar reconnaissance. The MRR variants flew patrols around the coast of the UK, primarily operating at high level and using the radar to monitor shipping, but also flying at low level for visual identification and inspection. They had a secondary role carrying out air sampling, flying through airborne contamination following nuclear tests, and using air sampling pods mounted under each wing to collect samples for analysis. The MRR variants served with 27 Squadron, RAF Scampton, incidentally that's the home of the Red Arrows, from 1973 to 1982, at which point the Nimrod took over these duties. 
The aircraft has been modelled to an exceptional level of detail and features a variety of 4K paint schemes with PBR materials and real-time reflection covering its time in RAF service, realistic payloads including blue steel, thousand pound bombs and bomb bay tanks and ground equipment. The aircraft features a fully 3D virtual cockpit with smoothly animated 3D instruments and functioning fully custom coded systems and avionics. So that is the just flight description for this aircraft off their website. Taking a look at the aircraft, the one that I'm going to be looking at is X-Ray Mike 600, which should be back on your screen now. So this is the aircraft I'm going to be taking a look at, and we're going to explore the modeling and texturing now and seeing just what we can find. Now, according to this on the detailed description, it says accurately modeled. I think it is. And you'll see a couple of screenshots also of their modeling process. Unfortunately, they could not supply me with any wireframes because they did not have any. But they do have some without the textures. So you can see a few uh, bits without textures before the textures add in the normal maps and everything like that. You can see how much detail has actually gone into the modeling itself. Now, let's go ahead and go into FreeCam here. That way, we'll be able to get really close to this aircraft. There we go. So we can have a really, really good look. So we've seen the hose drum units on some of the liveries. So I'm not going to be going into that. But what I am going to be doing is taking a good look at this aircraft. So in terms of modeling, it's very, very well done on the outside. I do like all the little bits and bobs that they have. Everything's quite smoothly done. Everything looks fairly realistic. Even this bits here. That's done really well. You've got these little uh, pitot tubes and everything sticking out. Of course, the nose up front. That's really nicely done. Everything all around looks good. I've also brought up so if you click on the side normally you've got this arrow I can just scroll to get rid of it I've also taken out the rat which is the ram air turbine which is now being covered by a landing gear door this right here so they've modeled that as well I want to take a closer look at that is it just a, a texture or is it no it's actually modeled you can actually see that the the various fins so there you go that's that's actually modeled not just a not just a flat texture I've brought down the uh, entrance entrance bay door or entrance door to the aircraft so you have to climb this ladder up there and then maybe if I can sneak forward very gently very slowly we might be able to look up into the aircraft there you go you can look up into the aircraft and there's there's the flight deck uh, up there Could I actually go straight into the flight deck from here I'm, I'm curious now I do not think so I'm somewhere. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Here we go. I'm in. Uh, yeah. There you go. I'm now inside. I'm inside the flight deck. Everything works just uh, as you would expect. There you go. So we can go straight into flight deck. We are going to be having a look at this cockpit, uh, in a little bit of time. Let's go outside again. I haven't finished looking at the outside. Texture-wise, they're all 4K, as they said. Uh, I do wish they would supply some 8K textures. I think that would be awesome. Imagine having some of these in 8K, particularly for those those people who have computers that could run an 8K texture. I mean, this is really nice. You can see the normal mapping anyway on this aircraft. And what I'll do is let me move around the time of day a bit. And by moving around the time of day, we get to explore it in... in in different ways and just see uh, different angles. The aircraft itself is not very reflective as you can see. That's both a sign of uh, weathering and a sign of the actual paint, uh, paint that's used, but it's not a very reflective aircraft. You could just see that that's a matte, that's a matte paint finish right there. There's very little shine, but you can, if you just look closely there, you can just see how the texture has been created and that's fantastic that's not modeling there that's the actual texture itself that's normal mapping to ensure that um to ensure that we actually have something that looks fairly realistic and it's these small 
These small things that make all the difference. If that was flat the entire way through, it just would not look as real. But uh, because it's not, it's, it looks real. Oh, it looks a lot more realistic. You can even see the normal mapping there giving us some sort of little indentation uh, across for the for the different panels, making it look like there are different panels on this aircraft as opposed to just a smooth surface. Over on the top, you can actually see the old wings for the original Vulcan. They used to just go straight along there and then along and then down. Uh, in this variant, or I think the B2 variant added the, sorry, the B variant, not the B2 variant, added this different shape to the delta wing. And then the B2 variant added this setup over here. So that's how, that's how we know this is a B Mark II. All around this, all around this aircraft, it's really, really nice. Even the ground, the ground units have been modeled nicely. And this here, which is the engine covers. They've been modeled in quite nicely as well. To get rid of the engine covers, all you have to do is uh, start the battery and that will start removing the chocks and the engine covers and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, are the bomb bay doors open? They are. Let's have a look. That's pretty accurate. So I've seen one, I've seen under one of these. That is pretty accurate. I've seen this aircraft fly. I've been quite up close to this aircraft in museums as well. And I've seen it on the ground. Uh, in various states, both uh, in partially, I say partially destroyed, but uh, also in in a sort of preserved state in, in a museum. It's also quite a nice uh, picture to take, isn't it? So I'm just going to grab that as a screenshot. Right, we've had a look at the outside. We've definitely had a look at the modeling and texturing there. It's all really really nicely done and the same goes across all the liveries so let's go inside let's actually bring some noise to this aircraft because it's kind of uh kind of dull it is dark on the inside what i'm going to do is i'm going to that's not the one i want we'll go through all of this i'm just going to bring the batteries up because that's will actually light some of this up there we go all right battery is running and now what I'm going to do is, well, let's actually have a quick look at the inside. And you can see that, again, things are modeled really nicely. You can even lift these armrests up, which I am going to. You're going to lift them all up, just completely push, shove them out of the way. Do they bounce? No, that was just me. There you go. Lift them all up like that. And you can just have a look inside. I do have eye adaptation on so that uh, things are a little bit brighter. Otherwise, it would be really, really dark in this aircraft. In fact, you can see if I look out the window uh, how dark it is. So doing that, at least things lighten up a little bit. Again, texturing inside is, in fact, texturing inside is phenomenal. This aircraft looks used. This aircraft looks old. Everything on this aircraft looks, yeah, you could just see the amount. It, it looks like it's been used. It's seen action. That is, that's genuinely really, really impressive. I do wonder what a clean version of this aircraft would look like. It, maybe one of them is a clean version. I haven't had a look at all of them. But for this, this looks brilliant. I do want to see. I'm going to have a look if there is a clean version. If there is, I'll probably uh, show it to you as a screenshot or, or something like that. All the gauges look really nice. Everything looks modelled really, really well. And it's very, very high quality uh, texturing as well. Should probably not flick that. There we go. Okay, so having had a look inside at everything, I think it's about time we actually did a flight deck tour, cockpit tour, and familiarise ourselves with everything that is available. Brace yourself, this is going to be quite lengthy. Okay, so I've got, got the camera sort of settled where we are going to start, and this is on the left side, pilot side, 
and we're looking at the left instrument panel right here so we're going to be looking at that section there before i continue the reason it's got so many controls and we need to go over everything is because a lot of this is actually custom coded so they've got realistic uh, v or uhf radio units they've got fully functioning magnetic indicators the warning lights push to test buttons uh, the flight instruments are incredibly realistic you've got uh, a whole bunch of custom coded systems like the fuel system the electric system including the aaap the uh, rat the pfcs the um EA ehpp the mfs the tfr all of these things as you can see there's just loads and loads of abbreviations uh, so they've got all of this modeled therefore we need to go through so that we can understand where everything is going to be. Can I just switch on that floodlight? I'm actually going to just switch on... Oh, what? Oh. Well, that's interesting. Does that just work on... Maybe that lights up something else. I don't know. Let's switch on the floodlight anyway, because that's going to make it just that little bit easier to read. So, here we go. We'll go through the gauges first because that's probably the easier one to go through. Then we'll go through uh, the lights and then we'll do that all the way along. Then we'll go through switches uh, in the best manner possible. So gauges, well, uh, it's quite easy to see. We've got ourselves an airspeed indicator right there. Now with the airspeed indicator, you'll notice that it sort of goes around and then after two, five, it goes inside and then you've got three, four, so on. Interestingly enough, this thing will just continue rotating around, so you just need to know whether you're on the inside or the outside. That should be pretty easy to know, looking out the window, plus also looking at the Mach meter here, that should give you an idea as to how fast you are going. So this is relative to the speed of sound, obviously standardized for air pressure. So we've got ourselves two speed indicators there, knots and Mach meter as a... Uh, Mark, you've also got yourself a radio altitude in the, uh, altimeter there. You've got yourself a standard altimeter there. You've got yourself a vertical speed indicator there. This here, this turn coordinator artificial horizon, this is a standby instrument. Normally that's your primary instrument as we've seen on other aircraft. This is a standby instrument on this aircraft because that there is the primary instrument and that is known as the director horizon so you can see it it looks a little bit more complicated than that but essentially it does a similar thing you've also got down here something that looks like a standard compass but has a lot more in the way of different lines and things that is your beam compass we'll be having a look at that when we're actually flying and seeing how that works so that's your beam compass. Then down here, we've got ourselves a DME. Now this is linked to the nav one, uh, nav one frequency. So whatever you've dialed in there, that's going to show a DME for that, as long as it's got a DME beacon, so a VOR or something, as long as you've got VOR DMEs as that coupling. Okay, so that's the gauges in this small block done. Over here, we've got ourselves uh, an oxygen indicator light. So that will that will go white. In fact, if I press the test button down there, you'll see there you go. So that's what it does. So you've got one, two. So that's an oxygen indicator there. You've got yourselves um, trying to read some of these now. It's difficult to read these. That one there is the auto throttle comparator light. That's a failure warning light, but that one is inoperative. We've got the TFR warning light, TFR video light, and TFR fail light. TFR stands for terrain following radar, I believe. You've got the ILS mark light there. And then down here, you've got the crew escape. Now, I have no idea. I mean, you can press these and they light up nice and blue. I genuinely have no idea what they are used for. 
crew escape lights. It says rear crew escape. I haven't yet figured out where everybody sort of sits in this aircraft. I'm pretty sure there's more than two people in this aircraft, so yeah, maybe that's something to do with that. So that's everything there, I believe. So far, fairly easy. We've also got this over here. This is the MFS Annunciator. That's a military flight system Annunciator. And you've seen the floodlight for that. Let me switch these on. Not sure if those actually work. Might be slightly annoying. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to move over to the middle. Yeah, the middle also doesn't look terribly difficult, but it is going to start getting harder and harder um, as we start, especially as we go to the side. So what do we have in the middle? Well, let's have a look. First of all, up here, these are the LP cocks right here. So this is how this is what we use to uh, open them up so that we can feed fuel in and everything like that. I think this is for the LP low pressure. We've got ourselves some warning lights over here and uh, annunciators. So we've got main warning lights there. You'd have two of them. They will switch on whenever there's uh, any failures of the PFCs, which is the powered flight controls, the fuel units, or the auto stabilizers. So if there's any failure on that, these will light up. There's a PFC unit warning indicator. You've got the artificial fuel indicator there, the auto stabilizer indicator, air brakes position, position indicator, which I think I can, there you go. Well, I opened them, but now, now they seem to be stuck open, probably because they're not, uh, it's not powered. So you can see that that lights up. You've got the alternator failure warning lights. Then you've got your bomb bay doors warning there. Now I could go ahead and close those doors. And you can see there, you've got the light, uh, the line saying it's closing. And then it's gone, saying it's closed. I'm doing the same with the air brake. You see I'm moving the air brake and it's closed. There you go. So that's how those work. You've got the canopy unlocked. I've not figured out how to unlock the canopy yet. You've got the entrance door unlocked. So if we were to close the entrance door, that would disappear as well. There you go. You've got the pitot heater, uh, indicator light, and then of course the other warning. Over here we have an accelerometer, or a G-meter if you want to call it a G-meter. Just tells you how much gravity, gravity you're pulling in the aircraft. I do like this over here. This is quite nice. This is a control surface uh, indicator. So it tells you where your control surfaces are and uh, you know what, what the position is of them. So to give you an example, I'm just going to use the rudder. The rudder doesn't want to respond right now, probably because the battery is on. But if I was to move them around, you would actually see that moving. It's, is it trying to power it or what? Let's try and kill the battery and see what happens. No, does not want to move. Well, that's an interesting one. It's moving fine when I tested it a few moments ago. Probably done something silly on it. But those move up and down and side to side really, really nicely. It's really nice to see the whole analog system as opposed to the digital systems. I think these are these are really quite cool. Continuing with the gauges, before we go over any switches, we've got ourselves the jet turbine uh, temperatures. Uh, I think it's the, the exhaust temperatures for, for them. I forgot what they call them, jet pipe. So the JPT, jet pipe temperatures, for all four engines, one, two, three, four. We've got the fuel pressure for one, two, three, four. We've got this engine, uh, this one, this engine uh, control light does not work. So that's an inoperative light, but those four do. Then we have the RPM indicators for all four engines, naturally. Oil pressure indicator, so that's a tachometer and oil pressure indicator there. Uh, in the middle, right here, that is um, actually a tachometer indicator. So similar to a VOR, but a 
military one. It actually will show the bearing though to the NAV1 VOR. So whatever you set, set in NAV1, that is what it will show. Uh, down here we've got ourselves the center of gravity indicator and that's you can actually use that button to check. So that tells us whether we're nose heavy or tail heavy. You've got yourselves the landing lights. This is interesting. I have no this is a really neat thing, but I have no idea why it's done. Actually, I do know why it's done because you can tell there that that's dimmer than that. Let's let's bring ourselves over to nighttime and just see how it shows. Is that night? No. That's night. I suppose it's just a bit dimmer, that's all. Okay, well, let's bring daylight back because we are going to need it. There we go. Lovely. I really like the shadowing on this. Really, really like the shadowing. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, what else? Is there anything else I haven't pointed out on this? Oh, this. This is the hydraulic triple pressure gauge. So you can see it. it's just uh, measuring hydraulics. Uh, then we've got this here. I forgot. To, I did forget to mention that one. That is the autopilot trim indicator. So you can see the trim uh, indicator right there. So it just tells you where where you are. With all of that, now I guess we can go to some of the switches. That there is the undercarriage switch. Landing gear, of course. This one here is the hydraulic power pack switch. They actually read it there, hydraulic power pack. Over here, this is our parachute controls. Yes, we have working parachutes in here. So if you were to press down, it would extend or deploy the parachute. Then you pull up and it jettisons said parachute. We might, we'll definitely try that when we land. Over here, we've got ourselves the MFS uh, selector. So again, military flight system. So it just tells us uh, how, how we can use these things. So you can see we've got different variants or different ways to do it. Localizer, glide path. Let's just leave this where it is for now. I don't know what that one actually does. I'm not actually I've not actually used that yet. And I think that's everything. I think that's everything on the center panel. So, we'll now move over to the right-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, there's a few things that are different, but I'm not going to go over Mach meter, airspeed indicator, uh, altimeter, director horizon, VSI, and the, uh, what do you call that one again? The, come on brain, uh, the beam compass, that's it. I was saying compass something, not beam compass. So that's those ones there, we've been through that. And we've been through that as well, the uh, MFS annunciator right there. So we're going to look at these. So we've got ourselves some warning lights. We've got a uh, Bombay warning light there, TFR warning light there. We've got again TFR fail warning light there, TFR video light, a marker right there. We've got a switch to be able to switch between TFR, terrain following radar, and MFS, the military flight system. We've also got wing and fuselage fire extinguishers for the port and starboard side. We've got ourselves some radio altimeter limit lights right here. We've then got ourselves some controls. For the windscreen, we've got the de-ice, we've got the demister, and we've got the... That's what I forgot on the other side. There's one of these on the other side. That's a windscreen wiper. There you go. That's annoying. Let's, let's uh, shut that up. That's very annoying. Right. Let's continue to take a look. Right here, we've got ourselves a fuel flow indicator per engine so we can select this per engine I think uh, I might do that at some point during the next couple of episodes and then we've got ourselves a total fuel flow indicator there and over here we've got ourselves an ADF indicator so this the one that reads relative bearing you just dial in an ADF and it works just like a normal ADF over here we've got ourselves a fuel flow reset button and then of course we've got ourselves a floodlight I'm not sure what that floodlight is actually four. 
Now, I genuinely do not know what that floodlight is for. Okay, so that's all of that done. There's more. There's a lot more. If we press 1, actually, if we press uh, 7, 4, we get to this one. So we've got a whole additional bunch of buttons and a, a whole new panel set all down here. That one works. What does that do? Nothing, as far as I can tell. UV lighting. Some of these just do not do things. That's that's the only thing. I wish I wish some of these maybe lit up things in red and whatnot. Maybe there's another way to switch those on. This looks like a canopy release. Can I use that? No. Okay. Anyway, moving on from there. This here is our it says UV lighting dimmer switch of course and then this is our oxygen regulator so you can see that we've got oxygen you do the test and uh, you know you can move that over like that there you go oxygen flow and oh, come back come back come back there you go just switch that off coming along here we've got ourselves another set of controls you can see that these controls have a fair amount of yellow striping on it for warning. We've got ourselves a radio altimeter controller here. Right there, that's one there. We've got ourselves the bomb bay doors here, so I can swap that to auto. That's the bomb release safety lock. So it's very you've got to be very careful with that. You don't want to be dropping uh, bombs when you're not supposed to. Or in some cases, possibly fuel tanks when you're not supposed to. You've then got yourselves a bomb door normal control there, and then you've got yourselves an emergency bomb jettison there. Probably when there's a fire, you, you flick that. Moving on from that, we have ourselves the aerial changeover switch over here. So we can go ADF to ILS, TACAN, however we want, and we can go to RT1 and RT2 uh, upper and then we've got ourselves uh, the on off button for that as well down here we've got ourselves the uh, abandoned aircraft switches so you've got abandoned aircraft don't look, press that, I don't know what, what it does and then you've got emergency decompression switch right there behind that behind that we've got the TFR controller so this is a terrain following radar controller so you can select what height you want so you can say height selector feet times 100 so that's what 400 feet above terrain so we can say oh, we want to go 700 feet I'm going to try this I'll probably give this a go and see if it works probably won't because of my flying but you never know moving on from there we can just move down here and we've got a whole bunch of things right here so we've got PFT and artificial field start buttons which is one, two, three there, aileron, roll, elevator. Then we've got ourselves a comparator reset button, which is this one here. We've got ourselves your dampers, of course. We've then got ourselves some stop buttons, 10 of them. Uh, port elevons, uh, elevon, by the way, is an aileron and an elevator combined. Delta wings have elevons, not ailerons and elevators. So that's why they call it Elevant. You've got yourself, so you've got those four, those four for support and starboard, and then two for the rudder. Up here, you've got yourselves some pitch damper controls. So there and there, that's for port and starboard once again. You've got yourself some mark trimmer resets, there and there. I'm not sure if that's for port and starboard there. You've got yourself a that's a master reset this one here you've got yourself some field warning cancel buttons so if you've got the warnings that is what you press there and then you've got yourself the artificial field lock switch and the indicator lights which you can see lights up wonderful now we'll go further back so I've got to press one to get back here over here we've got the audio warning isolation button which is up there we've got the test button right there then we've got the RT tone one on and off 
uh, switch right there. Over here, this here is the captain's station box. So this is where we select our frequencies, and we can we can dial in dial in the different fre frequencies right here, so you can see whichever way we want it to go on. Over here is our UHF slash uh, VHF, I suppose. So that's our frequency selector. You select the channel. This apparently works as well, so you can save a channel and then jump back to that channel. You, we've got ourselves the uh, radio volume control there. We've got ourselves the uh, frequency, sorry, channel selector there. Frequency selectors up here. What's this? I think that's the frequency. Yep, there you go. There's the frequency selector. I've got a feeling that doesn't really show up in on the actual aircraft, but to help us, they've given us that so we know what's going on. Uh, that's that's a really nice touch to have that just so we can see uh, what's being dialed in. I'm sure it's written somewhere, but uh, it'd be very difficult to find. You'd be hard pressed to find that. After that, we've got ourselves the engine controls, or some engine controls. Engine starts for one, two, three, four. Rapid start tries to start all four at once. I'm not going to press that. Just lights all of those up. Back here, we've got ourselves the, is that the gyro? I think that's the gyro hold off push button. Then we've got a few switches and an enunciator right there. So we've got ourselves the ignition switch there. We've got ourselves the start master switch there. And that is the cross feed indicator. So if I do that, you'll see it goes from close to open. And then over here, we've got the mode. So whether you want normal mode or rapid mode, and then that uh, changes how everything works. Lastly, we've got ourselves some ventilation or air suit ventilation. So this is the temperature control there. And that is the flow control. I think that's everything on this side. Are we done? No. That's not the one I want. Here we go, moving over to the other side. Same oxygen controls there, so I'm not going to go through that. It's, this is in the way, but uh, we'll go through this section now. In fact, let me see if I can just... Uh... There we go, that's probably easier to see. Okay, so we've got ourselves a cabin pressure selector there. So you can just move that. It's just a literal lever that you can move around. The temperature control valve position indicator, you can see that's sitting on cold right now. The selector is right here for the cabin pressure, or cabin temperature selector, sorry. Then we've got ourselves these switches across here. So this is our engine air switches, all of them are shut. And then this here is our cabin air switches. We've got the ram air valve indicator there as well, letting us know whether it's open or closed. Then we've got the switch right next to it, so that will allow us to open it up. Over here we've got the cold air unit overspeed indicator. I do not know. I just haven't got a clue how that works at the moment. This is the cabin temperature control switch, right there. Then we've got ourselves a, another lighting switch, which again, I do not know if that works or what it does. I'm assuming it does, but probably only at night. We've then got ourselves a flood flow switch, which is inoperative. So this one doesn't actually do anything, but we'll just leave it in normal. We've got ourselves the AAPP air bleed indicator which is that one there. Then we've got the cabin air bleed switch, the abandoned aircraft switch, and then the air to air refueling pressure gauge. So that's another one there. AA, AAPP, but that really messes with your brain a bit. AAPP stands for Airborne Auxiliary Power Plant, by the way. RAT, which I mentioned earlier, stands for uh, Ram Air Turbine. And then you've also got uh, the SCP, Secretary Control Panel. And I think, I think I'm think i getting through all of them, all the abbreviations. There's a lot on this, of course. Uh, we've got ourselves some additional controls over here. So, this one here, probe lighting. 
Sure, I'll just light that up. Let's just see what happens. This here is the refueling probe dimmer gauges. We'll see what happens on that. The nitrogen paired switch is right there. The tank pressurization switch is there. Over here, this display here is the air to air refueling indicator. Then we've got ourselves some pressure indicators there for the four tanks. And then over here, we've got the master switches for the air to air refueling. Moving along here, we've got ourselves the airframe anti icing auto manual switches for the port and starboard wing and engine and the ECM in intake. We've got the temperature gauges there. That's the anti icing temperature gauges. So you can see that they're reading a fair temperature. So that's not really a problem. Down here, we've got ourselves the engine, engine anti ice switch. And then over here, we've got the manual heat control switches for the anti ice port, starboard engine, and then the manual ones in the middle. Then we've got this little panel down here. This here is our pitot heater switch. There you go. We've got the autopilot switch, which is apparently painted on. The sign is actually written on. That's brilliant. I love this little attention to detail. It's fantastic. But that's the autopilot power switch. We've got some light switching. So external lights, then we can have it on standby or Morse. I'm not sure what the Morse ID light would do, but uh, apparently, oh, maybe you do that. So you, you actually flash the light. Unfortunately, I cannot test that because I cannot look outside the aircraft at the same time as being inside the aircraft. So that, that would be nice to, to uh, check. But that's a tail light. That's on the back. And it, the, that one there just, it just lights up red. Then we've got our landing light, port and starboard. So you can go landing or taxi. And then you've got yourself your nav light. So that is just uh, because that's off. That's why that's not staying on. Uh, that's just your steady light. So you've got yourself your port and starboard red and green light. When you go flash, that goes to strobe lights as well. Next to that, this one here is the ECM monitor alarm control. And then slightly further back, we've got the ventilation for your suit again. And I think, I think that might be about it. Oh no, wait, there's something back here. Windscreen overheat indicators right there. So there we go. That's that. Are we done? That's the question. Are we done? No. Still a little bit more to go. Control column, let's quickly go through this. We've got the nose wheel steering gauge button down at the bottom. There you go. You've got the elevator and aileron field relief switch here for the elevons. You've got the aileron and elevator trim switch here. And then you've got your push to talk switch. That one was easy. Get rid of that. Perfect. Up here, we've still got more to go. We've got the E2B compasses, which is just your compass whiskey. Um, I think that's just the model E2B. I think the only difference was E2B had a red background, whilst the E2, I think E2 or E2A had the white background. And this is controls for the ram air. So this is the rat release handle that will pull the rat, rat back and then that will deploy the rat. So let's just push it back. And then this is the fire warning lights and extinguisher buttons right over here. Can you press any of them? No. Interesting. Okay. Are we done? No. Still more to go. Because as you can see, we have the throttle quadrant area. This is pretty simple, to be honest. If we have a look at this, we've got our fuel in thousands of pounds. So we've got ourselves a, an anti-dazzle switch there. We've got our fuel in each tank. Uh, so number one engine, number two, number three, number four engine uh, fuel contents. So what they do is they, they look at the fuel contents of each engine, the group that's connected to each engine. We've got ourselves a parking brake right there. Yep, that looks like the parking brake. A cabin altimeter right there. 
uh, rudder field relief push button right there rudder's trim switch there we've got ourselves the hrs mfs switch there we've then got if we move down here the rpm governor switch which is that there so you can do takeoff and cruise so that's how how we do that we can close that as well just leave that nice and closed so these things all have guards which is really quite uh, quite neat of course we've got ourselves our throttle controls uh, these ones are inter interesting you have to lift them up with the mouse because you have to unlock them so okay, I can't actually lift these up because of where there you go and now they're unlocked which is great that's I don't I'm not sure how you lock them again I'm not sure what I'm pressing underneath that I guess we'll find out let's have a look oh well the throttles have disappeared lovely what was it that was I did something ah interesting one throttles reappeared not a clue why or how ah I can just click on these and they'll reappear very nice how do I make them disappear again then and that's just bringing them back into lock as you can see okay continuing on with this what do we have here we've got an inoperative auto throttle so that's something that's not going to work and I think it also does say that it's inoperative in the manual we've got ourselves the emergency controls for the landing gear right there we've also got ourselves the sorry that's the emergency control for the landing gear that is the air brakes emergency switch so landing gear manually uh, manually push that landing gear down air brakes we've also got on this side it's very difficult to to look at this this looks like the bomb release this is a bomb release button right there oh yeah let's not let's not do that there we go and this here is the JPT limiter so that's the jet pipe temperature limiter but uh, switch right there we then have this retractable console yes it's retractable uh, you can just pull out the back and there you go over here we've got a little bit of things just a few just a few things we've got the autopilot turn control that's what I've been messing around with autopilot turn control we've also got pitch control right there we've got the emergency trim control then we've got the fuel uh, transfer switches right there and there so that's the fuel uh, center of gravity or transfer switches there we've got the refueling lateral center of gravity switch there we've then got the auto manual switches there and there and then we've got the tank context uh, content push buttons and the tank pump switches so these are all uh, the pumps for for the actual aircraft so that's all of that there all the way down of course it brings us down to the uh, cross feed position indicators and the cross feed cock switches slightly further down here we've got the Bombay tanks pressurization switch which I think is inoperative and then we've also got that's that one there I believe we've also got the pressure indicators there and there as far as I can as far as I can tell and then right at the bottom we've got the autopilot stuff yes now we're on the autopilot there's a track switch glide switch power roll uh, aileron elevator we've got the ready indicator there we've got the autopilot in indicator there we've got the uh, bomb switch there we've got the altitude or IAS indicated airspeed switch there autopilot engage switch there and I think that was everything apart from that one which is the auto land switch which doesn't work are we done no nope. we are not done but we are almost done that's why that's why this video is so so long so how close are we to being done we just have to go through the these two so let's bring these two up so we have the ACP and the AAPP AAPP 
as I mentioned before, is the airborne auxiliary power plant. And then you've got the uh, ACP, which is the auxiliary control panel, I believe. So AAPP, let's go through, which one should we go through first? I guess we'll go through, sorry, ACP, alternator control panel, not auxiliary control panel. Let's go through the ACP since that's the one I got wrong. We've got the voltmeter for the incoming alternator there and we've got ourselves a rat field switch there the rat test there extra supplies button there we've got the alternator selector switch where's the alternator select switch this one here another test switch for the aapp incoming alternator frequency we've then got the synchronizing bus bar voltmeter we've got also these i think these are magnetic indicators the rat synchronization indicator the aapp synchronization indicator uh, magnetic indicator obviously we've got that warning there that's the alternator failure warning light which is fine at the moment the aapp synchronizing button and then we've also got the synchronizer bus bar frequency so frequency there voltage down there underneath that we've got more stuff we've got the alternate synchronizing magnetic indicators one two three and four and of course with their standard isolation uh, valve we've got the non-essential supplies reset switch there so we can just go trip reset and you can see that there it changes something on the aapp as well and then we'll just reset that there um, alternator isolating buttons as I said next to each synchronization uh, indicator and then you've got the warning lights one two three four coupled with their resets uh, reset buttons down there underneath that we've got the alternator key KW or kilowatt or kilovar what's var I've forgotten uh, but we've got some gauges for that and then we've got the cutoff switches for each one of these we just switch cut them all off there we go hey look no problem with the alternator anymore that's good over on the secondary supplies panel which is uh this ooh, this one here this is the secondary supply panel the ssp we've got the port tru switch we've got the starboard tru switch then we've got the ammeter for both of them we've also got the port and starboard transformers and we've got the magnetic indicators for those as well there you go see how that works we've got the low shed magnetic indicators there port and starboard we've got the battery isolation switch there of course the battery switch which we've seen we've also got the uh, DC voltmeter there and then two switches here which are the ration heater switches and then lastly we can go up to the top of this we've got the JPT gauge that's the jet pipe uh, jet pipe temperature gauge we've got the fuel level magnetic indicator showing me high at the moment on that we've got the air pressure gauge we've got the starter button do not attempt cartridge restart until light is out we've got the low pressure cock switch high pressure cock override we've got the ignition switch uh, ignition isolation switch right there fire test button which does it work not sure the oxygen and relight switch is that afterburner oh I want to try that at some point and then we have the master switch right there and guess what that is the end of the flight deck tour i know that is a lot to take in but it gives us an idea where everything is and what some of the things stand for so you can see the amount of detail that is in this aircraft already and we haven't even started the aircraft up that is what we are going to be doing in the next episode i think i need to take a breather Thank you very much for watching. Please remember to hit the like button if you like this video. Subscribe to the channel for more videos on X-Plane 11 and of course for part 2 and subsequently perhaps part 3 as well of this uh, 
in-depth review. Leave a comment in the comments box below letting me know what you think. If you've picked up this aircraft, let me know what you think. You've probably got a lot further than I have already, uh, but I want to know what, what you guys think. I really cannot wait to hear the howl from the Olympus 301 engines, which incidentally also were developed into the Concorde engines. So Concorde's engines are a successor to the engines on this and the howl on these is incredible. I've heard it in real life. It's a brilliant, brilliant noise. Uh, if you do really enjoy these videos and can afford to do so, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. Link is in the description box below. It's www.patreon.com slash ecgadget. Your support would be massively appreciated. And also, you can find me on social media at ecgadgetlp for both Twitter and Instagram. That's all from me, and I'll see you guys next time in X-Plane 11 for part 2 of the Vulcan Review.